Welcome back to season two of Snubs and Dubs, where we're talking about the snubs and dubs of the 87th Academy Award for Best Picture. I'm your host, Kyle Tobiasen, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Jason Miller. Jason, how's it going? Kyle, I'm hungry <laughs> for some chef. <laughs> oh, yeah. How are you doing? I'm good, too. Yeah, this movie does have that food. It, it should have a warning. <laughs> But it should have a warning where if you are going in, don't be hungry because fucking hell, there's so much good looking mm. food in it. Or be hungry and True. get a heightened <laughs> hunger afterwards. <laughs> but the problem, you got to sit with that for the yeah. entire length of the movie because True. they they start you out on some pretty <laughs> cooking picks. So like, yeah, you're in for the long haul, mm -hmm. but. That food's going to be so good afterwards. <laughs> oh, my God. Or you'll just be incredibly disappointed when you try to make a grilled cheese. And yeah. it does not live up to that of Carl Casper's. It doesn't have that golden brown crunch on the outside of it. Oh, yep. my God. Did you watch anything in the last week? Nothing heavy. My girlfriend and I finished Is It Cake? Cool. I can report back some was cake. <laughs> Every episode, some of that was cake. But that's like the only thing I've actually watched in the last little while. Nice. Um, It's fun. Yeah. It's cake, not all of it, <laughs> but some of it certifiably cake. And I love when there's like a contest show of this caliber because mm. the guest judges they bring on. Mm. There's like a couple people whose names have done things and then there's a couple people they made up. Like, <laughs> like their big get in the final episode are still like the least famous members of things. <laughs> And I, awesome. I love it. I think like <laughs> Carly Ray Jepsen was the wow. biggest. No, it was Rebecca Black. I have those okay, two confused. Wow. I, That's pretty cool. Actually. They live in the same mental space for me. <laughs> it was Rebecca Black. And I was like, oh, that was not the final. I'm not going to yeah. reveal the final judges. But that was one of the season judges. And I was like, oh, good for them. They got Rebecca Black. <laughs> I feel like we could get Rebecca Black. <laughs> what <did you> <laughs> like? <laughs> Oh, we funny. probably could if <laughs> cake could get her i think yeah. we're okay <laughs> how about you kyle what did you watch this last week wow did i ever do some watch oh. um so the first thing that i watched was on the saturday after we recorded and i saw Lightyear. right how was that it was pretty good interesting yeah it was one of those pixar movies where i would say it does not go to infinity and beyond mm. but it does reach the acceptable level of quality that you would expect from an animated Disney movie. That makes sense. Yeah. Although I feel like going to infinity and beyond would be the one stated <laughs> goal that that movie has. So that yeah. doesn't really doesn't, that, that doesn't do so great. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's like, it's really safe. That's mm -hmm. the one like kind of good thing and criticism about it is it's like really by the numbers in a sense. Yeah. It doesn't really try to make a huge commentary in any way. Like it's just learn how to be a team. Aww. That's kind of kind of it. Yeah. So, so if you didn't know before, <laughs> you could become a team by watching <laughs> Buzz Lightyear. It's a good one to watch at home, I think. Yeah. Okay, that's fair. So not one to rush out to, but still good. Yeah, well, I'm kind of excited. I imagine that's going to be streaming, if not already, then sometime soon. Oh, yeah, for yeah. sure. It'll be on Disney Plus before you know it. Speaking of Disney Plus, though, Obi-Wan finished. Uh, what are your thoughts? I, as a whole, it wasn't the most amazing thing to me. But mm -hmm. the finale fucking kicked ass. Nice. Like the the main part of it is like Obi Wan and Vader. Obviously, Kiss. that's kind of yes. Nice. Oh, yeah. All right, Huge I'm tuning in. <laughs> I'm leaving. I'm cutting mid recording. I want to see yep. him smooch. <laughs> it was always a will they won't they that I wanted to see come to fruition. <laughs> yeah, but no, like their ultimate confrontation is fucking epic. Nice. It's so cool, and it's like really well choreographed. And just badass. Like, this is how I wanted to see Obi-Wan and Vader. Like, this is just, like, peak Obi-Wan and Vader. But, like, the rest of it, yeah, it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's, like, overall, as a show, okay. I think there's a really solid two-and-a-half to three-hour movie in this six-episode show. I've heard that. Because... I'm imagining it fell victim to some of like the streaming show pacing yeah. where there's a lot of lull parts and it doesn't really set itself up for like as tight of arcs as like yeah. traditional television would, even though it released on a weekly schedule, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. So that's kind of interesting because you think they would actually kind of tighten that up. Maybe a little bit. Yeah. yeah. But, but yeah, somebody will do it. Somebody yeah. will do that edit and then maybe I'll watch it. Probably won't though. <laughs> <laughs> And then the last like new movie I watched, I saw it today, was The Black Phone from mm -hmm. Scott Derrickson starring Ethan Hawke. 
It's a good movie. Nice. Don't go in expecting a horror movie, though. It is definitely more of a thriller with like some supernatural elements to it. Mm -hmm. But because it had some supernatural elements to it, I was always expecting kind of like a rug pull in maybe the third act that related to this supernatural element of it. Mm -hmm. But there never really was. Interesting. And so it just kind of like wrapped up kind of as you would expect. Oh. And that's good, I guess. Like it was a satisfying enough ending, but like I just didn't really feel all that like amazed going out of it. Yeah. Like it's really well regarded so far. And that's why I was eager to go see it. But overall, like it's just a fine movie, a fine thriller, fine mm-hmm. kidnapping story. Because they've really marketed this as like a good horror movie. Yeah. And like if you watch the trailer, that's kind of the idea that you get is that it's a horror movie. And I also expected some like Shyamalanian twist to happen in it. It just seemed set up for that. Like, oh, the call is actually um, your grandma (laughs) checking in on you. You're at home eating a tray of cookies. Like I kind of thought there'd be like some big kind of like (laughs) almost formulaic setup to it with like an unexpected twist, but you know, there's going to be some kind of twist. Mm -hmm. Maybe the twist is Kyle. There's no twist. Wow. I mean, there's an eight year old girl that says, what the fuck Jesus in it. Oh, which is probably the best part. Jesus at (laughs) the point. (laughs) Yeah. So she was a good character, but overall movie pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Didn't phone it in. Uh, (laughs) I did watch two other movies though last night. I was I was uh, pretty busy. Fiend, Uh, and it was because of the impending pressure that we only have five more movies to live. (laughs) We die at the end of season two. (laughs) And so I was like, shit! I had to do some other watching of movies that we're not going to talk about. And the two movies that I watched were Still Alice and Predestination. Oh. Still Alice took home the best actress winner of this year. And so that's kind of why I wanted to watch it. I'm glad we didn't talk about it because overall, I don't think there was that much that we would have had to say about it beyond Julianne Moore's performance Mm -hmm. because she really kills it as a woman in her fifties who gets early onset Alzheimer's and just like her kind of going through that decline and how it affects her family because it's like um, paternal uh, is that the word? Ma- maternal for motherly, paternal yeah, for fatherly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Mater- for. So you can yeah. be passed down to her children, essentially. Yeah. And so there's like conflict with that. And mm. overall, good movie. Yeah. Hard to watch parts of it because obviously it's uh, like, mm-hmm. I think it's, it might be a true story or based on a book or something. Obviously, probably based on someone's real life experience because yeah. a lot of people have this disease and it's horrible. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, Julianne Moore, probably the best thing to come out of that. Obviously, she won an award for that. Yep. But uh, yeah, that's kind of it. Predestination was good as well. It was a very interesting movie. It was like a sci-fi about time travel. And there was some kind of weird stuff happening. Hmm. Uh, I don't really know how to explain it without giving it away. Interesting. the results of all of the time meddling was like strangely taboo. And the choices that people made was a little bit... Incesty? I don't know how oh, to tell them the best wow. way to describe that. <laughs> um, but it was very interesting. That's Dang. for sure. And it was like a short movie, like 90 minutes. So huh. not hard to watch. Was that, Kyle, did you just watch like a porn parody of it? <laughs> was this? It was on this weird website called <laughs> X Hamster. <laughs> then we watched Peen Destination, <laughs> <laughs> starring Ethan Cock. <laughs> Oh, that was better. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Man, I dislike time travel movies. Really? There are movies that use time travel that I don't hate, but mm. for the most part, whenever a movie's based on time traveling, something about it just ticks me off. Mm. It was fine. Yeah. In uh what's well, Interstellar. Yeah. Honestly, I kind of dug it. Yeah. But because it was such a very small linear part of the storyline, it's when they go back and change things that always frustrates me because there's yeah. always the like, well, why did they do that? They could have done that. Mm-hmm. Like with the Avengers, why did they choose all the worst times to travel <laughs> back to to get the Infinity Stones when there are large periods of times where it's easier to grab them? Stuff like that <laughs> always bothers me. I, yeah. mean, I don't want to think about, well, why did they go back in time to have sex with their siblings? I don't need to know. Is it, or is it like, and so, like grandparents? No. Is this like oh, is this like Back to the Future kind of like previous generation thing? <laughs> no, 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 no. It's it's much weirder than that. Oh, I'll hate say it. that. Yeah. Well, I yeah, I'm probably not going to watch that one then. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll explain it to yeah. you after the, the okay, episode. Okay. I have delicate a, sensibilities. Yeah. So I will not be partaking in that <laughs> filth. 
<laughs> All right. Well, other than that, the only other movie I watched this week was the one we're talking about this episode. And of course, season two of Snubs and Dubs is covering the films from the year 2014. And so for episode 21, we're talking about Chef. You hadn't seen this before. I have not seen Human Atui before. <laughs> this was my first time with it. <laughs> <laughs> but you have, and I know yes. this is a big one for you. Oh yes, I love this movie. That's a little pre thoughts uh, ahead of my ahead of my reviews of this movie. I fucking love this movie. Mm -hmm. It just makes me happy. It's easy to watch constantly. It's mm -hmm. like easy to rewatch. It's just one of those like it's like Paddington in the way where it is like a bundle of joy type movie. Yes. where like if you're having a hard day, this is a great movie to throw on. Yeah, watch a guy get fired. <laughs> Watch a guy not connect with his son. Yeah. <laughs> you'll, feel, you'll feel better for it by yeah. the end. I don't remember the first time I watched it. Mm -hmm. I don't think I saw it in theaters. And I, I was watching some interviews with John Favreau about it afterwards. And I think they dropped this in the summer season, which was a bad idea. Because, yeah. Like, I mean, it is kind of a summery movie, mm -hmm. which makes sense seasonally. But they dropped it within like all the superhero movies like Captain America and Guardians were happening around this time. Yeah. And so that was probably not the best thing. But this would no. have been a good winter escape movie. Yeah. If this was like you're going in from the cold and dreaming of mm. Miami. Oh, <laughs> that'd be incredible. In the summer, you're already kind of warm and this yeah. is a sweaty kind of movie. <laughs> like it's, this is kind of movie. Everyone's sweating and you're seeing that on screen. You're, you're kind of sweating a little bit. The heat's turned up. Yeah, and I did realize this when we were doing the schedule, but yeah, this is a back-to-back -back ScarJo double whammy because it you get a little ScarJo in last episode. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of ScarJo and a lot of ScarJo. A lot of episode. ScarJo. And then we get uh, a good amount of ScarJo in this episode. Yeah. Wow. Very different things being eaten, though. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very much so. All right. Well, if you were interested in Chef, I've included the links to the physical media related to it in the show notes. If you buy through that link, it'll help out our show. Or if you have any other Amazon shopping to do, follow the general links to help out our show in the process. A reminder that this is going to be a spoiler filled conversation. So if you haven't seen Chef yet and you want to go ahead and do so, I've also included time codes in the show notes so you can skip around to your heart's desire. But without further ado, let's get into it. Chef is a 2014 American road comedy drama film and also the equivalent of making a movie about the kind of argument you have in a shower after a bad day, for John Favreau at least. <laughs> this is directed by John Favreau, written by John Favreau, starring John Favreau <laughs> wow. as Carl Casper, Sofia Vergara as Inez, John Leguizamo as Martin, Scarlett Johansson as Molly, Dustin Hoffman as some asshole named Riva, and MJ Anthony as Percy. It has a runtime of 115 minutes and was released on May 9th, 2014. So Kyle, you've kind of gushed about it a little bit. Yeah. What did you think specifically on this rewatch? Still love it. Oh, uh, nothing's changed. I don't think so. I feel like I was more receptive to the fact that the last hour is very fluffy. Yeah. It is pretty much completely void of conflict. Yeah, absolute victory lap. Yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. going for a nice little walk in the park. Yeah. And I did notice that like my kind of active engagement in terms of like how often I was laughing or just like gleefully staring at the screen did sort of have a decline as it hit that sort of constant fluffiness mm -hmm. because when he's in that crisis mode, fucking hilarious. Yeah. It's so funny. But what did you think of it? I wish they went a little bit further in a lot of directions. Yeah. Because in my opinion, this never really had any laugh moments. Really? This had maybe one or two. This had a lot of smile moments. This yeah. filled me with warmth. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I was a little smiley boy with big old rosy red cheeks watching this thing because yeah. it filled my belly with happiness and joy. Mm -hmm. But it just, it was very safe. There yeah. is minimal conflict and the conflict that does happen is kind of played up in like a slapstick kind of way almost, mm -hmm. especially with that uh, lava cake scene. <laughs> It's That's molten. my favorite scene. <laughs> yeah. I have that on my like YouTube watch later list ever since I watched the movie again because I can't help but go back to it. It's yeah. so funny. That was like the big scene. Yeah. Otherwise, it's not particularly daring. Mm. There's not much conflict, which I don't think is really a big issue with this movie. It doesn't no. need to be. Yeah. It's kind of just like a warm 
happy movie. He doesn't have to have like some big crisis and he doesn't need to have some like massive depressive episode after getting fired. Like it still, it works plot wise. Yeah. I just wish they filled it with more. That's fair. Yeah. Like I totally agree with that. It is. I mean, I made the comparison to Paddington earlier, but it is very much like that where a mm-hmm. lot of your enjoyment is just kind of like watching these characters in their element, but it definitely could have used a little bit more conflict yeah. at times. Mm-hmm. This could have used more padding tin <laughs> because it's a little light. All right. Well, did you want me to read through the plot? Uh, why don't you hit us with the plot, All Kyle? Right, I'm going to go straight through the plot. If you don't need the refresher, you can skip right to the discussion by following the time codes in the show notes. But here's Chef. Miami-born Carl Casper is the head chef of Galois in Brentwood, Los Angeles. While popular with his kitchen staff and hostess Molly, Carl clashes with the restaurant's owner, Riva, who wants him to stick to classical cuisine rather than innovative dishes. Carl also has a strained relationship with his tech-savvy preteen son, Percy, and his rich ex-wife, Inez. When Carl has the chance to serve prestigious food critic and blogger Ramsey Michelle, Riva demands to he prepare old favorites at the last minute. Carl concedes, leading to a scathing review. Carl insults Ramsey on Twitter, not realizing that his reply is public and gets a large online following. Carl comes up with a new menu that his staff loves and invites Ramsey back for a rematch, but it leaves after confronting Riva, who still wants the old menu. At home, Carl prepares the menu he wanted, while his sous chef Tony serves Ramsey the same dish from his prior visit. Ramsey tweets negatively about Carl, provoking Carl into confronting him at the restaurant. Videos of Carl's meltdown go viral, leaving him humiliated and unemployable. Carl reluctantly accepts Inez's invitation to accompany her and Percy to Miami, where he rediscovers his love for Cuban cuisine. At Inez's encouragement, her ex-husband Marvin offers Carl a food truck. Carl and Percy bond while restoring the rundown food truck and by buying groceries, and Carl gives him a chef's knife of his own. Martin, Carl's friend and former line cook, turns down his promotion at Galois to join Carl, who has reignited his passion as a chef. Carl, Martin, and Percy drive the truck along the country to Los Angeles, serving Cuban sandwiches and yucca fries. Percy promotes them on social media, and they find success in New Orleans and Austin, where their daily specials include pole boys and barbecued brisket made with local ingredients. Back in Los Angeles, having strengthened his relationship with Percy, Carl accepts his son's offer to help with the food truck, with Inez also joining with them. Ramsey, the critic, visits the truck to explain his bad review. Though an early fan of Carl, he was disappointed by a meal he felt was beneath Carl's skills. Impressed with the chef's return to form, Ramsey offers to bankroll a new restaurant where Carl will have full creative control. Six months later, the successful new restaurant is closed for a private event, which is Carl and Inez's remarriage ceremony. But that's Chef. Oh, wow. Thanks for serving up that big old plot summary, <laughs> Kyle. Well done. Is this the best movie to feature a Twitter feud? I can't think of a better one. <laughs> um, I don't. I think for a lack of competition, it damn well might be. Yeah. And actually, I didn't hate how they showed social media in this movie because yeah. normally it's painfully cringy when they talk about things going viral. Mm-hmm. I'm a little dubious about if a review of a restaurant could ever go viral in the way that this movie has it happen, yep. but they need it for the plot. I'm willing to overlook it. Honestly, it was kind of fine, and I'm glad that they showed Casper not fully understanding it. Mm-hmm. I think that worked to its favor. Yes, definitely. I mean, the critic Ramsey, he's got some zingers. He kind of does have some <laughs> he heat. He digs into it. I, I wrote down one of his replies to Casper's tweet where he's like, you wouldn't know a good meal if it sat on your face. It is verbatim. I would rather have you sit on my face after a brisk walk on a warm day than suffer through that fucking lava cake again. (laughs) Fuck me. And especially after going after, I mean, that was a bit shallow, but going after his like weight gain. Yeah. That was a bit low, but um, yeah, I mean like you can know where his head was at. Yeah. I mean, Casper stepped into the ring with a pro. He didn't realize (laughs) what was going on. Clearly he just wanted to send like a little hate mail to someone, but like he, what he underhand lobbed that ball to, <laughs> the Ramsey, reviewer yeah. as he had like three baseball bats in his hands yeah. all swinging he deserved that yeah. that clap back and Ramsey even says that to him later like when they when he goes to the food truck he's like mm-hmm. what did you think you were doing you were coming into like my game like yeah. this is my field yeah and you, you think that you were gonna like 
what get me oh <laughs> yeah with like nothing even you would know a good meal if it was in your face like that's so weak yeah you gotta bring a bigger game than that <laughs> but we talked a little bit about the fucking molten scene but mm-hmm. john farrow fucking crushes that he scene. sells it he commits i feel like a lot of that was imp- improvisational because of the caliber of actors you have in this movie yeah and i mean even just like with the the subject matter like it's very easy to play around and try different things and, mm-hmm. and improvise. Like these guys all have chemistry with each other, like through the Marvel movies, obviously Scarlett Johansson and John Favreau and, and Robert Downey Jr. and John Favreau and everybody in that sort of area. Mm-hmm. So like there's room to play, but you could tell like he was given his 110% during that lava cake scene. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and I love that this is an indie movie because it's the indie movie that can only be made by a massive Hollywood producer <laughs> who doesn't care about money anymore. Like this is yeah. an indie movie with some of the biggest names in the game, yeah. like acting in it. Yeah. Did you pick up on the big allegory for this being essentially about John Favreau in a autobiographical sense while using food and chef culture as like a replacement for movie making? Yes, I did. Yeah. Well, I, I kind of like while I was watching, clearly this is a one man therapy session. Yeah. So like as I was digging around, I saw that this was shortly after the Iron Man 2 flopperino yeah. and they do some fun like references to it with like when him and his son go to see a movie, they have the Iron Man sounds yeah. going on in the movie theater. But like you can kind of tell that this is even though food's in there, it's not about the food. Yeah. This is about John Favreau's career in a much different way. Yep. But I think if anything, knowing that about the movie kind of added to it. Yes. You, Cause that does help give it some more material when you know that like everything on the screen is him just working through something. Yeah. And it's not really about the, like it is about the food obviously, yeah. but it's about a little bit more than the food. And you, can kind of pick up on that and give it some more meat from knowing that. Yeah. Knowing the context does elevate the movie a little bit too. Mm-hmm. And I don't think he's been shy of like acknowledging that fact because no. like I was watching an interview and they basically ask him explicitly and obviously, yes, like you're going to take a piece of your personal experience into that. And when critics were absolutely shitting on him for mm-hmm. Iron Man two or people that were just like disappointed because they had these high expectations because he has a history of quality of work and then it wasn't to their standards that's like also kind of hits hard too and like it also helps that Robert Downey Jr. and Scarlett Johansson are both in this movie yeah especially Scarlett Johansson who doesn't like leave the restaurant with him mm-hmm. she stays alongside Riva and Tony when they stay in there and I mean it's not like Scarlett Johansson was going to leave the Marvel ship because John Favreau wasn't directing the Avengers. Cause I think that was something that was going to happen. Yeah. Was from what I've heard, he it? was originally slated to direct a bunch more of Marvel movies, including the Avengers. And yeah. then he, I guess somewhat walked away from directing it specifically, but yeah. still helped produce it. Cause yeah. he was definitely a producer for a long time running. Mm-hmm. And he still starred in all the Iron Man and even the Avengers movies as like happy Hogan, which is yeah. the character he put himself in the movie as. But I mean, Riva essentially is that demanding studio that's just like breathing down the neck saying, hey, we're going to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. And he wants to be an artist like he literally in the movie he says like, well, now you want to be an artist. Yeah, well, we're going to give him the hits basically. And so like, yeah, it's it all plays out really well. I think the food representation, the allegory works really well with that. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, especially with like the scene where he does quit, where Dustin Hoffman walks in and is like, we've sold out more seats than ever for this menu. Mm -hmm. They're basically like winking at the screen that like we have more people buying tickets to these Avengers movies than we've ever done before. (laughs) Yeah, it's pretty thin, but I think it works better because of that. He didn't really try to hide it, which gives it some more depth. Yeah. And I mean, at the end, he gets bankrolled by somebody to make, you know, a bigger thing. Yeah. That still has his creative control. And look, look at him fucking now. Yeah. Look at you know, him. He recovered. Yeah. <laughs> he's doing better. Yeah. He's like the fucking quarterback of new Star Wars on TV. Like, yeah, he's got he's he's fine, guys. <laughs> yeah. And I'm glad we got this movie as a result of Iron Man 2. In Me a sense. too. This is the best thing to come out of Iron Man 2 <laughs> by a lot. <laughs> Actually, I didn't hate Iron Man 2. No, was just, I don't it hate was it just fine. Yeah, um, it's fine. Yeah, I'm not going to shit on it too much. Honestly, <laughs> it, was, it was OK. Yeah. Okay, what did you think about the father son relationship? Because I kind of felt. It's been done so many times and this did not have a special twist on it. Like it was, I still cared about it because mm. also the actor for Percy, very good for a 10 year old. I yeah. think 10. Yeah. I think probably was, yeah. 10. yeah. In, in Wikipedia says it's preteen, but I'm sure he's like 
10, 11, yeah, something like that. Something like that. I thought he had a good performance, but I yeah. kind of felt like that dynamic was just like, this is not a special take on that at all. Yeah. And when the interesting part is the arc about his career, that kind of gets brushed aside. I think just to give it a more complete, like emotional conclusion, but I didn't really care that much about the father son bond mm. getting fixed when like, you know, it was going to happen and it didn't start off even really that resentful. Yeah. So I was just kind of sad. No, that was one thing I would say is like, I, I know that his character is probably representation of what 11 or 12 year olds would be at that time where mm-hmm. they're kind of just like, Oh no, that's fine. Or I'm just going to, you know, go on my iPad or did you do this? Did you do that? Or like, you know, kind of like nonchalant about their feelings. Yeah. And so, that made sense, but it also like didn't make it more exciting because mm-hmm. he's they're just like having conversations and he's kind of just like whatever about things. Yeah. And I mean, obviously he gets excited, but like he never really gets that sad until he's told that he's not going to be on the food truck anymore. Yeah. And that was like at the end of the movie and in the next scene it's resolved anyway. So, yeah. And I think like one of the biggest gripes I have with this kind of rolled into that is that no other character really has much going on or an arc to them outside of John Favreau's character, yeah. who is obviously the main big deal of the movie. But like, yeah, his ex-wife is the same starting at the end. Yep. Scarlett Johansson is forgotten about a little bit into the movie. Yep. I mean, his one chef does become the head chef of that one restaurant wow. that we learn doesn't let the chef have any creative control whatsoever <laughs> anyways. Yeah. And then his number two, who finally got promoted to sous chef, he quits yeah. <laughs> to join John Favreau. So like, it, yeah, it's lightweight. Yes. There's not necessarily anything wrong with a lightweight, good shots of food, warm mm. up movie. But I felt like overall it's light. Yeah. It's a little weak, but it's still, it brings some happiness. Yeah. In. <laughs> I love this scene, which may be resemblant of your opinion on this movie, where John Favreau is cooking a grilled cheese and he's giving it fucking everything. He's All buttering he's the edges. He's giving it layers of different types of cheese, cutting it in half and handing him his son this beautiful oozing golden grilled mm. cheese. And he's like, it's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's all his son has to say about it mom cuts a crust off so <laughs> this is subpar you piece of shit <laughs> i would have yeah. loved to him see him hop on twitter and give like the same review that the critic did like, this fat idiot's lost his edge oh, unlike my, my sandwich which has it fully on may i add oh great what did you think of the robert downey jr scene i didn't really like it it was kind of like all right Robert Downey Jr., we're going to have you be a misogynist who gives uh, Casper money. Yeah. And then just be Iron Man again. Really, you know, just do that thing again yeah. in a different movie. And yeah. then don't show up. You don't need to after that. You're kind of just there to hand over some money. Yeah. He is essentially a, like a glorified cameo. And like, I, I always found that I wanted that scene to be like more exciting, but it never is. No, it really it's, isn't. Yeah. It's just like essentially a very fluffed up scene to get him the food truck. Yeah. And where it should be like the kind of a low moment for Carl in a sense, because he is at his lowest. He's going mm-hmm. to his ex wife's ex husband to get yeah. a food truck so that he can then start to support himself again and maybe find his groove. And it ends up just being kind of like weird. Yeah. Just weird. <laughs> yeah. And like, I kind of thought that he would get the food truck by going down to visit his ex's dad. Yeah. Which would still have the same effect of your, yeah. you know, you came to your ex-wife's dad for support, which doesn't look fun. Yeah. Clearly his ex-wife is loaded. Oh, you look yes. at that. I was like, you already <laughs> have a reason for there to be enough money to get this thing yeah. for free for him. I don't know why we needed Robert Downey Jr. to make weird conversation about maybe or maybe not getting a secretary <laughs> pregnant. It just seemed weird. And also maybe or maybe not having sex with his ex-wife after Carl and his ex-wife divorced. <laughs> like, yeah. Like why was there added beef in there for I that? Don't I don't know. It was just weird. And I feel like this was a largely improvisational scene. Oh, and it, it kind of like showed it. Yeah. In, a, in a bad way. Yeah, because you can kind of see Robert Downey Jr.'s thought process of I'm going to start with the normal done before thing of I am a sexist who got <laughs> who, who had sex with my secretary. Yeah. And then you see for him think from a but what if I'm not? <laughs> and then he tries that for a little bit. Thinks, no, I think I am. Yeah. Let's keep it yeah. safe here. This oh isn't going great. Yeah. 
And props to John Favreau for hiring Sofia Vergara as his ex-wife Good and move. Scarlett Johansson as his uh, fling. <laughs> Big respect. <laughs> like, <laughs> gotta recognize two, that game. Like gorgeous women. And yeah. <laughs> I mean, good for him. I mean, you see him cook for I'm Scarlett Johansson. Sure. That was a very you, horny scene. I felt as Scarlett Johansson did in that scene. I was I was sizing him up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like, man, if I could get food like that every day, mm, don't know if there's a thing I wouldn't do. <laughs> um, yep. Yeah. Well, uh, we, we have, we've, we've shared our opinions on it. What do you think critics and audiences around the globe are saying? I think it's largely positive. Uh-huh. Uh, I, because of some of the, you know, issues we've mentioned, it being very light and fluffy. I don't know if it's going to be that high critically, maybe like an 82, 81. And then audiences I could see going a bit higher, like a 90, maybe not bad. The critics gave it an 87. Okay, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah, the critics actually enjoyed this one, mm-hmm. unlike his shitty unimaginable food. <laughs> the audience is 85, a little bit okay. lower, but like we're they're pretty in agreement on that. Yeah, that's fair. IMDB has given this a 7.3 mm-hmm. and Metacritic a 68. Oh, that seems a little low, but yeah, yeah, especially with like the Rotten Tomato score being significantly higher. Yeah. In terms of money, this has a box office of 47 million. On a budget of 11 million. Not bad, not bad. Yep. Like an unfinished meal, it's got a box going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like a lot of people saw this movie on streaming. Like yeah. A lot of people found it on Netflix afterwards. And Netflix has the Chef Show now, which is mm-hmm. like essentially a g- generic food show with John Favreau and Roy Choi, who is like the guy that John learned cooking from. Yeah. And as the movie went along, he actually got a bigger part in producing it too. Yeah. Yeah. Good for him. I think that, I think this was kind of where his like celebrity was growing. Cause he was already like a big food celebrity, the Roy Choi, but then yeah. like he kind of got heavy into TV after that wow. as well. Good for him. Yeah. Uh, this finished 129th at the box office. Yeah. Which technically is an independent movie. Yeah. So not I'm, bad. I mean, I'm surprised that Robert Downey Jr.'s cameo didn't boost this budget onto like 40 to 50 million because yeah. that guy just wants so much money. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if after he gave his performance, he was like, mm, I'm going to take a cut. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll <laughs> give you a little back. some of that, <laughs> actually. <laughs> My yeah. Bad. I mean, with the caliber of actors you have in this movie, granted, a lot of them aren't in a large majority of the movie, but yeah. still like Dustin Hoffman. Yeah. Like that. He's just he's like a small role, but still like that's fucking Dustin Hoffman. Yeah. I wonder if a lot of this was just like John Favreau was making a small movie on his own to kind of come over some things. Yeah. I'm going to throw him a bone. Yeah. Well, I noticed that the casting director was Sarah Haley Finn, who is the casting director for all Marvel and Star Wars projects at Disney. Interesting. Yeah. I didn't make that connection. Yeah. I mean, I that's probably a, a MCU obsessive obser- observation, but yeah. like I wasn't um, going to say that. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, like it was probably an easy casting job for her because John was probably like, "Hey Robert, hey Scarlett." I mean, mm-hmm. in terms of like John Leguizamo and obviously the kid, like there was like some extra casting that you would have to do. And Dustin Hoffman, that's a good get. Like That's a good get. Good yeah. Them. Yeah, so yeah, I'm surprised the budget wasn't higher. Honestly, yeah, me too. Mm-hmm. But what do we think for our scores? Kyle, we're going to start off with your score for enjoyment. I have a 4.5 on enjoyment. Nice. I myself am going to slap this down a 3.5. That's I had a good fair. time watching it. It just didn't hit the heights that, I, that I was maybe hoping. What is your craft? I'm going to give it a four. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. think it is very well shot, very well directed. The sets are cool. The yeah. truck is great. Yeah. The score, oh, awesome. It's a lot the of music. fun. Yeah. It's so, a lot of fun. And the way they shoot food and oh, how oh. they like, I, like I mentioned, I was watching an interview with them. And obviously when you're shooting food, like food is associated with taste and you can't taste the food that's on the screen. Mm-hmm. So you have to make people want to eat it and, and feel that feeling through like sound and visuals. Yeah. And they really really crush it with that absolutely i'm agreeing with you wholeheartedly i'm also slapping this down a four it's just kind of a fun soundtrack yeah definitely. yeah it's just a lot of it is a good time this is where the good times really show in my opinion <laughs> yeah is what they're throwing on the screen mm-hmm. for you it's your execution i gave it a four i think it's largely well acted well written for the most part i think that last little bit maybe is a little fluffy and some of the performances are just fine yeah 
but most of the time, really good. And obviously, I think a whole point of that was just for John Favreau in the fucking molten scene. <laughs> uh I'm going to slide this a 3.5. I was thinking quite a bit between 3 and 3.5. Yeah. But I think the overarching warmth and good feeling it fills you with is going to kick it up to a 3.5. Yeah. But I agree with you. The writing's a little shallow. Mm. There's not the most going on in this movie, but they put a good fun product on screen. Yeah. That's what movies are about, baby. That's a (laughs) 3.5. And finally, your rewatch ability. For me, this is a 4.5. This is a movie I will always tell people they need to watch if they haven't seen it. It is a movie that I will religiously rewatch and will not ever be bored of it. It Mm -hmm. is just a great time. And I I want more good food movies. Yeah. Like maybe that's the niche that I like love the most secretly. There's just not Mm -hmm. enough of them. Well, you very openly love Ratatouille. There's (laughs) no secret about that. Well, yeah. And like this is another great quality cooking movie and i just fucking love it something about food and movies it just yeah. w- works man well you love movies and ke- check this you love food <laughs> it's a match made in heaven you're yeah. a good cook too yeah I just need Thank to you. see you make a movie see if it's as tasty <laughs> i'm making this a three for rewatchability sure i'm very glad i gave this a first watch yeah i don't know if i'm ever gonna throw this on myself maybe if this was on i'm watching though yeah that's kind of the key if anyone put this on i'm gonna sit there and watch it cool well, for final scores, Kyle, you're going to be giving this a 17 out of 20 for an 85%. You liken that. And I'm giving this a 14 out of 20 for a 70%. I'm good with it. <laughs> yeah. It's there. It's good. It's good. Ranking time. Kyle, want me to read yours? Sure. All right. Grand Budapest, Paddington, Captain America, Guardians, Dawn, Interstellar, Gone Girl, Nightcrawler, Under the Skin, Lego, Selma, John Wick, What We Do in the Shadows, Boyhood, Snowpiercer, Babadook, Imitation Game, Big Hero 6, Foxcatcher, American Sniper, The Theory of Everything. This is my new number seven over Gone Girl and under Interstellar. I had to give a lot of time to think about this and I'm glad that I did it before the episode because I would have just been sat there staring at this screen for a long time Mm because I really had to think what the core qualities that I would rank them on would be Mm -hmm. and it also comes down to enjoyment and mostly rewatchability as well. Yeah. When I looked at it and I got to Gone Girl Nightcrawler area I was like it's just an easier movie to sit and enjoy. And that's probably where I'm going to land it. Probably so, yeah. where it's going to be at. Yep. That's fair. You? Well, I'll just go through mine real quick. Yeah. Grand, Budapest, Paddington, Dawn, Interstellar, Gone Girl, Nightcrawler, John Wick, Selma, Guardians of the Galaxy, What We Do in the Shadows, Under the Skin, Lego, Babadook, Captain America, Winter Soldier, Snow, Piercer, Boyhood, Big Hero 6, The Theory of Everything, Imitation Game, Foxcatcher, American Sniper. I'm going to be a bit lower. Yes. But weird. I'm going to be slapping this under... Under the skin, above Lego. Wow. Yeah. Good. Lego finishing lower than I thought it would so far. Yeah. But movies come in that just kind of bump it down for other aspects. Yep. But Chef is going to be my new number 12 Great. for now. Mm. We'll see about that. Honestly, RIP any movie in the top like little while or like especially at the bottom yeah. because this next stretch, holy Ooh, they're getting sweet pushed. mother of God. <laughs> they're getting shoved down. <laughs> the theory of everything thinks it's low now. <laughs> Just you wait, buddy. You ready for some fun letterbox times? Oh, yeah, for right. sure. It's not here. <laughs> it's not oh, this no. movie. This has a 3.6 out of 5 on letterboxed and yeah. some of the worst reviews that I've seen. <laughs> this movie deserved better than that. I'm not even that huge on this movie audience out there we need to look at ourselves and say what the fuck did we do in this in this review <laughs> section the reviews that were supposed to be funny they fucking sucked oh no the jokes in there they were bad <laughs> i found one review that was maybe worth writing down and highlighting okay. so i'm gonna say it and then we're gonna move on all right we're not gonna give it any any further thought to the fun yep. letter box reviews jaxi five stars no stakes no drama no real plot just cubanos and good vibes and yet a perfect movie. <laughs> yep. yep. Kind of the feelings. Yep. Yep. That's that's letterbox for you. All right. <laughs> awards detail. Great. Um, at the Academy Awards. No, it didn't. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was not. Yeah. I don't know what it could have gotten. I don't know if it, it was needed just, anything. I always thought about like score, but it's not score mostly. It's mostly no. music and that doesn't really work for score. Yeah. <sighs> Yeah, I don't know. It didn't need anything. I don't think so. I'm fine with that. Yeah. If there were food categories, it would be competing. 
Could be swing with the big dogs. Definitely. But there's not, so it, it just didn't. Mm-hmm. Other notable awards, no. <laughs> no, it didn't. <laughs> this is not an awards kind of movie. Yeah, no, that's fine. It's Yeah, it didn't do anything so good that it beat other movies. It just did yeah. a bunch of things enjoyably. Yeah. Yeah, so awards, don't think so. <laughs> Interesting facts. Kyle, first of all, there's not... Oh, <laughs> this movie wow. is devoid of background interest other wow. than it's one man getting mad at his last job. <laughs> That's really the only interesting <laughs> thing about it. But something's worth mentioning. Promotional events centering on the fictional Cubano-serving El Jefe proved to be so popular that Favreau and Los Angeles-based chef Roy Choi, who consulted on the film, have opened a series of pop-up restaurants and announced that they're thinking about making the track permanent. Wow, cool. Yeah. That's that's good for them. John Favreau did his own cooking by training with Chef Roy Choi. Choi sent Favreau to a week of intensive French culinary school where Favreau sharpened his knife skills and learned how to make sauces. Quote from Roy Choi. I brought him into the kitchen and he just kind of fit in. Choi recalls. I threw him a couple of tests like a case of chives or a case of onions or peel two cases of avocados just to see where his mind and his situation and his abilities were and how interested he was in these things. He just attacked them. He really became part of it. Eventually, five years after this film release, Favreau and Choi teamed up again on The Chef's Show, yep. which is a cooking documentary show on Netflix. Good for them. Those are facts. <laughs> uh, a couple more here, uh, mm. still mostly about the cooking. Roy Choi only agreed to train John Favreau to cook if Favreau promised to be absolutely authentic in his portrayal of a professional chef. From the way that his character Carl folds the towels at the beginning of the movie to the way in which he cleans his station. His training was designed to keep Favreau focused on the smallest of details and to serve as a method acting exercise in order to understand the mindset of a professional chef who must be persistently detailed focused in a pressurized environment. Wow. Yeah. Well, more on that. According (laughs) to John Favreau, Twitter paid nothing for product placement or advertising. In a Hollywood Reporter article, Favreau reported that the company requested only that some tweaks be made to the look of the animated logo before signing off on the use of its product. Cool. Yep. I mean, I liked how they showed the tweets in it. Yeah, I think that was actually pretty good. Kind of flair. Yep. And last one. Oh, boy. This is the first (laughs) non-Iron Man collaboration between writer and director John Favreau (laughs) and Robert Downey Jr. That's This is what I was going for. (laughs) This is what I had. And like, I knew there was no letterbox (laughs) review, so I added more. They kept getting lamer. (laughs) You got Twitter. It was fine with it. And Robert Downer Jr. is in this. What? (laughs) Robert Downer Jr.? (laughs) Robert Downer Jr. is in this movie. (laughs) It's not Iron Man. That was a fact. That's so funny. Oh, Oh my God. Oh, my God. Uh, Kyle, do you have anything else to think about this movie that you'd like to vocalize to people listening? No. I mean... I feel like if you were wanting to get a sense of what this movie is about, Google the lava cake confrontation scene on yeah. YouTube and watch it because it's got some of my favorite shit in there. I like when he's just like, what do you do? You just write shit. You just make <laughs> shit up. That shit was molten. Oh, it's just, it fucking, it's so good. <laughs> that is the highlight of the movie. It is. A, like you need to get there for it to work. But yeah. like also, it's, it's still good after that point. Yeah. But if you really enjoyed that and you have something else to do, mm. maybe you hit pause and go do that thing. I don't know. I didn't hate <laughs> it, but like that's clearly a peak. Yeah. And it's pretty early in. Yeah. It's still good. after. It's still good. It's still good. after. Yeah. Yeah. Check it out. Check it out. Find your thoughts for you? No, I think I've said my piece. It's yeah, I'm going to say one more thing, though. <laughs> it's like a warm soup on a cold day. Yeah, but there's a little less meat in the soup than you thought going in. Hmm. That's my take on chef. Good, decent noodles though. <laughs> decent <laughs> noodles, noodles, noodles are there, <laughs> and there's a couple peas. Only a couple peas, but you, there's they're there. Yeah, it's a soup you would take a spoonful of and go. It's good. It's good. <laughs> it's good soup. <laughs> all right. Well, I want to thank you all for listening to season two, episode twenty one of Snubs and Dubs. Can't believe we're in the final five movies. That's I know. crazy. That's insane. Feels like we just started season two. I know. Jeez. <laughs> feels like season one was 10 years ago, but it feels like we just started season two. <laughs> yep. As always, you can find us everywhere on social media at Snubs and Dubs. That's on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Letterboxd, etc. We're also on Good Pods, so make sure to check us out there and join our official Discord. We love to hear guys' thoughts on Chef or on this episode, so please send us a tweet or a message with a question, recommendation, or anything else. I'm also at Kyle Tobias and on Twitter, and Jason is at Wendy underscore Mills. Of course, all of those links are going to be in the show notes. 
Make sure to leave a five-star review, share the show to everyone you know, and check back next week for another episode. Here's a sneak peek of the film we're going to talk about. Five, six, and... I want to be great. And you're not. We got Buddy Rich here. Little trouble there. You're rushing. Here we go. Five, six, and... Were you rushing or were you dragging? I, I don't know. <laughs> If you deliberately sabotage my band, I will gut you like a pig. That's right. Next time we're talking about the last Best Picture nominee of this season, Whiplash. So make sure to watch it before next episode. Can't wait for you guys to hear it. Thanks for listening. That's a wrap. Bye. Bye for now. Bye.